Brian De Palma is one of the most well-respected filmmakers in the game, often telling compelling suspense thrillers that left audiences shook and upset. One of the most controversial films he's directed is 1980's Dress to Kill. Brian De Palma, the master of the macabre, who shocked audiences everywhere with Sisters, Carrie, Obsession, and The Fury, now invites you to a showing of the latest fashion in murder. <coughs> Dressed to Kill, Michael Caine, Angie Dickinson, Nancy Allen, Dressed to Kill, Murder Made to Order. Here's a few interesting facts about the film. Some spoilers lie ahead. If you haven't seen the film, you can watch it on Tube. Please like and subscribe for more cinema content. This can be seen as an inversion of the Psycho formula. In Psycho, an introverted young man and his mother are the villains. The psychiatrist is the good guy who comes in at the end to solve the crime and explain Norman's devious serial killing slash cross-dressing ways to everybody. In this movie, the psychiatrist is the villain, who is also a devious serial killer and cross-dresser. The introverted young man and his mother, are the good guys in this version. Somewhere in 79, I got the idea for Dress to Kill and wrote it on the dinner table in my apartment. And um, you had started with Greetings and Hi Mom, which were whimsical, sort of Godardian, and then Sisters, and then Carrie, you sort of started to form this reputation in the genre that's sort of been associated with you. The Hitchcock the era. Right, and a, a certain kind of thriller. And at this point, did you have a sense of like what people expected from a De Palma movie, a kind of horror thriller? Well, I was still developing visual storytelling, so I like Sisters. And like Carrie, I started out with a kind of visual idea. And these ideas sort of, you know, are rummaging around in my subconscious. Writer-director Brian De Palma originally wanted to direct Cruising, but couldn't come to an agreement so he ended up directing this film instead. Brian De Palma sold the screenplay of this movie for $1 million. Writer and director Brian De Palma specifically wrote the role of Liz Blake for his then-wife Nancy Allen to play. She was the first and only actress to whom he offered her role. So you really think Autotron's going up? Well, I got it from a very good source. Angie Dickinson got the role of Kate Miller in this movie after the original choice, Liv Ullman, dropped out because of the violence. <laughs> The flirtatious sequence with Angie Dickinson and the mystery man in the museum lasts almost nine minutes, during which time no dialogue is spoken. Which was most likely a nod to one of De Palma's favorite directors Alfred Hitchcock. You talk about maybe some of the elements that go into the museum sequence, because on one hand it's long takes, walks through. You know, it's very important when you go to a space to walk around it, take photographs, see what's unique about the space. But leading up to it, it's a lot of little moments. That's the whole way of building a sequence. Using a very basic element of cinema, which is following a beautiful woman around. You right. can watch her walk, watch her look. And when you're in a museum, you've got a lot of things to look at. You put a character in a position, and then you have them look in various ways, so the audience gets very acclimated to the geography of the location. Geography is very important when you're setting up a suspense sequence because you gotta know where things are. Despite playing a major role, Angie Dickinson only has 30 minutes of screen time. I always had the idea like Psycho to have the movie star get bumped off, you know, 20, 30 minutes into the movie. It's a great idea. Yeah. <laughs> Work for Psycho. 
And I thought, well, how, how can I do that? And I was fortunate to meet Angie at a film festival in uh, Montreal. So I had this image of, the, of her character and then the audience getting involved in her particular dilemma and killing her 30, 40 minutes into the movie. Sir Sean Connery was offered the role of Dr. Robert Elliott by writer and director Brian De Palma, and was enthusiastic about this, but declined on account of previously acquired commitments. They worked together on The Untouchables, for which Connery received an Academy Award for Best Actor in a Supporting Role. William Finney is a regular in writer and director Brian De Palma's movies. He was known for being an odd villainous-looking character with a haunting voice. De Palma uses only his voice in this movie as Bobby. Dr. Robert Elliott's alter ego when in drag. This is Bobby. You won't see me anymore, so I'm going to have a little session with your machine. Oh, I borrowed your razor, and... Well, you'll read all about it. As a young man, at his mother's urging, Brian De Palma followed his father and used recording equipment to try and catch him with another woman. That incident inspired this movie. Michael Caine tells in his biography that director De Palma was a brilliant filmmaker but showed very few emotions with the actors and the crew. Angie Dickinson, Nancy Allen and Keith Gordon all praised Michael Caine's generosity and professionalism as an actor on this film. And Caine working with well, him. Well, Michael was just, you know, he's a great actor to work with, you know, and I was very fortunate because Sue Mengers, who was my agent at the time, represented him and, and suggested him, and I said, that's fantastic, I mean... Uh, Michael's a delight to work with. He's very witty, he's very bright. He looks so great and he seems he's so classy and has such authority. I mean, when Angie first goes there, you feel like, oh, this is somebody who really is taking care of her. Yes. You know, she's not taking care of Absolutely. at home. She's not, this is a real caretaker. The whole idea of dressing up as a woman, you know, he thought it was a great kind of joke and he quite enjoyed it. But I think we only dressed him up once in the last scene. Uh, when he gets shot. <laughs> I'll never forget seeing him in that outfit. <laughs> it, w it, was, it was quite amusing. <laughs> uh... Controversial for its time, the National Organization of Women organized a protest for this film, which only boosted ticket sales. Well, Dress to Kill, again, was very controversial because we were in the midst of the women's liberation movement, violence against women, had a very grotesque murder in it, and it got picketed, but it was successful. Somehow it transcended that. Thanks again for watching. Please make sure to like and subscribe for more cinema content and always remember to stay healthy and stay busy.